Renee wants to be a part of it. It's fine. <laughs> she really does. She's a part of all my blogs yeah. or podcasts. So, yeah. She's like, oh, you're recording? Yeah. Here I am. <laughs> I'm ready for my spotlight. Yes. <laughs> Hello, makers. Welcome to the Making Conversation podcast, where we chat all about making, the app and the act. I'm Jen, head of marketing for making. My pronouns are she, her, and my making app username is Knit Pearl. I was introduced to today's guest by the one and only Quaylen Stark. So I immediately knew how wonderful they were and that they have been on my very short list of people that I've wanted making to work with in one way or another for a very long time. So I was really excited when you agreed to come on the podcast. Hello, Whitney Marie Anderson. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for so joining much. us. Oh my gosh, Thanks I'm for so having excited. Me. I know we were just <laughs> we were just talking about before we started recording how like this felt like we set this up last year because I don't yeah. know, try and plan far in advance and then it's like you know what is time as well, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Do you want to introduce yourself to the listeners? Yes, yes. I'm Whitney Marie Anderson, and I ask people to call me Wit if they don't want to call me Whitney, like the full name, um, but some people like to call me Whitney Marie. I am also Whitney Marie Anderson on making. My pronouns are she and her. Awesome. And where are you based out of right now? I am currently in Vista, California, which is right on the coast near... Um, like a little bit above San Diego. As a cancer Pisces cancer, I always feel like I'm just like being near water is like necessary. You know what's so strange? I'm a fire sign and I would feel lost if I didn't live near a coast. Like oh my gosh, I love when that. I ever, whenever I travel inland, I know I don't know where I'm going. I'm like, where's the ocean? I see it over the ocean in it. <laughs> my direction and my bearings down yeah I love those it's the balance the balance of life right a fire sign mm -hmm. needs fire sign needs their water yeah so when did your maker journey start my mom is a maker like through and through and so just having her as a mom put me in that bracket and I started crocheting at like age four um I would sit over her shoulder like a little parrot <laughs> and watch her Aww. and so I got the orientation down and how to hold things just by watching her over her shoulder and um one day she set a project down and I picked it up and I started working on it and she freaked out at first because she thought I was like unraveling it <laughs> but I was actually putting stitch stitches in so uh she got me my own stuff at age four and Aww. I started from there Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you remember what the project was that you picked up and started? Yeah, it was like time? a baby blanket and um, mm -hmm. it was working on the border. So it was just mm -hmm. all single crochet stitches. And I just, because I kept seeing her do the same motion over and over, I was like, I can do that. <laughs> oh my oh, yeah. gosh. I love that. That's, that's such a great story. <laughs> that's so <laughs> cute. Oh, I just, I, I can picture it in my mind adorable if she sat on the couch i would like sit on the back of the couch like the ledge part and just lean on her shoulder and watch her so cute it sounds like she did a lot of different crafts yeah and it's really funny our pantry was her sewing closet we didn't have like a pantry full of food she used like the dish cabinet for food instead <laughs> the large pantry that was in our kitchen had like a sewing machine and like yarn storage and all her supplies and it's kind of funny because I turned our pantry into my tiny studio in my house and so I'm just kind of doing just what she did <laughs> hers was more so like you open up the doors and the shelves are there mm -hmm. um, but mine there's room for me to actually be in there and sit down so pantry <laughs> pantry storage is awesome <laughs> I love it what other crafts did she teach you uh, she taught me to sew. She taught me a little bit of embroidery, but more so for like mending and making like cute mending, like putting a flower on something over a hole or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely is not artsy on the drawing side. I learned all that from my dad. Fun fact, I actually taught my mom how to knit. Oh, my. Young grasshopper became the master. And then yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I taught her how to knit. Um, I learned how to knit when I was in high school, and um, 
she was like, oh, is that harder than crocheting? I was like, no, let me show you. Who taught you how to knit? I actually learned to knit by unraveling stuff. It was like Chris, your project. My teacher said, uh, you can use anything in the classroom for your project. And I just want it to be something that you can um, show off to the class at the end of the school year. And she had this big shelf of yarn that like nobody went for. And then everyone was crowded around like the paper crafts and all that stuff. So I was like, well, since no one's over there, let me grab some yarn. And she had knitting needles. And I didn't know how to knit. So I was like, hmm. <laughs> I took it home with me and I unraveled Renee. <laughs> we have a guest. We have a co-star <laughs> happening here. And <laughs> always with me. So I love it. I um, love it. So I took the yarn and needles home with me. Um, she let me take them home with me. And I also took a little sample that she had. And I unraveled it. I don't think she knew that I was going to do that. (laughs) But um, I I just went stitch by stitch. It was rib knitting. And so I noticed I was like, okay, this stitch seems to be like backwards. Um, And then I like used my fingers to put it back together and then unraveled it again. And then I was like, okay, stick the needle in. And then this is how we do it. And that, that was it. I knew how to knit. That's amazing. I... I don't think I've, like, how many people I've talked to and asked them, like, how they learn to knit. You're the first person that has learned in that way of just, like, yeah. Like, <laughs> just taking tinkering apart, around and putting it back together. Little sample. Yeah. That's amazing. There was probably some easier way to learn, but um, I think because she told us, like, you know, this is your senior project, so, like, have some pride and, you know, actually put your effort into it. I was, like, not even thinking about looking up books or anything like that, Renee. <laughs> hi, honey. Say hi. Okay, say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, you want to go sit down now? All right. I think she just really wanted to say hi. Yeah, that's okay. We love that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's probably a ton of easier ways. Um, I was in high school in, I was in that class in 2007. So YouTube was around, I think. Books. We're there in the library, but I just bypassed all of that and decided, you know, let me just tinker with this little sample. It was just a little square of ribbing. And then um, she didn't realize that I had put it back together or tinkering with it. That's awesome. As I've learned different crafts, Mm -hmm. like I feel like the undoing of things is like such a good way to learn the doing of things. Yeah. Yeah. I just sure. have never met anyone that like that's how they learned from the beginning. <laughs> I feel like once you know how to tank. Then it doesn't feel as scary, you know, that type of yes. thing. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. Yeah. But you totally agree. You learned how to knit by tinking. <laughs> yeah. What type of class was this? It was kind of like a mashup of classes. I guess you okay. could call it home economics because there was some um, baking teaching, but it was more so to get you to understand the science of it, um, mm-hmm. like how you know, yeast rises and all that. Um, and then there was painting. We did computer aided drafting. It was really like a motley class, like everything you could think of that was like artsy and a little bit of tech mixed in. So at the end of the year, when she said you can pick, you know, whatever you want to use for your senior project, some people went the computer aided drafting route. Some people went with painting and all that. And so seeing the yarn there was like, um, yeah, I can do something with that. (laughs) I actually ended up making a sweater out of panels. Yeah, I went above and beyond but it was yeah and I believe I I didn't know weights back then but I would have to say that it was like um bulky weight Mm -hmm. like um similar to like lion brands thick and quick Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making a sweater like in the front two front panels one back panel and then doing the sleeves and then sewing them together it was just like I can assemble some pieces and make a sweater. Yeah. It wasn't cute, but it was wearable. My main regret is back then I never took pictures of stuff uh, oh that God. I made. I, I took a ton of pictures of other things. I have pictures of parties, friends, hanging out at school, like the most random stuff. 
but I never took pictures. So if you're like a new maker and you're watching this and you're listening to this, take pictures of your stuff. It's going to be really cool to look, look back at things that you made, even if it's like, you know, you don't think it's pretty. So take Mm -hmm. picture of it. Yes. I, I definitely agree with that because it also shows you like your growth over time. Yeah. You're so close to something. Sometimes you don't see it as much. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. I still have my very first scarf. Really? Um, Well, scarf in quotes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's, you know, a little wavy in parts. It's a little lopsided. There's a lots of yarn over holes. It actually was drier one time. So now it's felted, but I still have it because I was like, this is, I need to keep this. Yes. I have the yeah. first thing I've ever cable knitted. Nice. So that was that was pretty major for me. It was it's a that scarf. Is major. Yeah, <laughs> nice. It's good. Yeah. And I feel like the scarf is the good is the good like go to like right? knitting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a uh, two by two rib and it has like three cables on each end. So like nice. when you've wrapped it, you see the cables like on the end. Nice. I just wanted to see what it would be like to cable knit. It's so funny because something like that, I was so intimidated. And I think that this is, I I feel like I'm not alone in this. I hear this often from other makers that there are Mm -hmm. certain things that you are like, that's very advanced, but we all fairly easy if you know how to knit and purl. Yes. It's just those two stitches and and yarn overs and whatnot, but like, Yeah. Yeah. How did your maker journey translate into owning your own business? When I made my very first amigurumi, I showed it to a few friends and family members and everybody wanted one. Like, oh, can you make me a bear? Can you make me a dinosaur or whatever? Um, For a while, I was making custom amigurumis for family and friends, all word of mouth. I didn't even have like a website back then. Yeah. Um. And for a while, I was even making, like, characters, little donkey named Chortro from a kid's cartoon that didn't really have much merch out there. So people were, like, going to me because they're like, I can't find a stuffed animal for this anywhere. Yay! I believe the cartoon was based in France, but it had... um, It had a lot of popularity because it was available in, like, five different languages. Mm -hmm. And it was on YouTube, so it was easy to access. So kids were like obsessed with it. I was shipping church rows to France, Denmark. When I finally got a website, they were going everywhere, like Australia. Like it was insane. Wow. Um, That's so rad. <laughs> yeah. So I was mostly amigurumi for when I first started business. Your very first was a teddy bear for your son, right? I started off with the teddy bear because it seemed pretty simple that, um, I saw a sample in Michael's when I was shopping for yarn and it was like all single crochet stitches. And I was like, I can do that. I know how to make a beanie so I can make the head, the arms, the legs all in the round and then just attach them all together. And I just kind of went from there and I made uh, the eyes out of buttons that fell off of like a shirt. Nice. Um, they were like kind of a kind of creepy. If you, if, <laughs> I'm going to have to send you a picture. Of it <laughs> yeah. Because I have pictures of it. Oh, and good. I okay. I'm like holding it and giving it a kiss. And I'm so glad that it didn't freak him out because it was kind of creepy looking, but <laughs> he loved it to pieces. So, okay. So, um, for those watching on YouTube, I, it's, it's up on the screen right yes. now, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, for those listening, uh, we'll, we'll make sure go, go watch on YouTube or I'll make sure to be posting it in other places. Yeah. I'll have to, you know what I'll do? I'm on making as at Whitney Marie Anderson. Mm-hmm. I'm going to post it on making. Love I, it. I don't post there enough. So I'll post Perfect. it on there. I love it. Awesome. When did you, so you went from Amigurumi into, now your business is more than that. So where did, like, yeah. was that path? Oh my gosh. I kind of bounced around doing different things. I went from Amigurumi to um, like custom bikinis. That was kind of like whatever people asked me, like, hey, can you make this? I was like, okay, I'll try. And I was making all kinds of stuff like um, bikinis or tank tops, like for like Coachella and stuff. Oh, yeah. I even made a pair of like short. Most of the time people that asked me for stuff were going to like 
music festivals or concerts, um, like country concerts out in, you know, out in the field and they want to wear something handmade or cute for their pictures. Mm -hmm. I kind of fizzled out on that because making those things is pretty time consuming Mm -hmm. and I definitely was undercharging. Yeah. So I started like slowly started declining requests. Like I don't have time to make this. And then eventually I was like, okay, this is not cost efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, And I started just kind of focusing on making things for myself. In 2019, I made myself um, some stitch markers. And then that became (laughs) the thing that I started making for people. I posted about them on Instagram. They were just two little brown girls with puffs, Afro puffs, Mm -hmm. and one with like locks kind of similar to mine. And then like, so like puffs of locks and then locks going down. When I posted that on Instagram, I got quite a few people like, wow, I've never seen stitch markers like that before. Do you sell them? And at first I was like, no, because this is the only ones I have and they're mine. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But then I was like, I guess I could make more. I still have more clay. So I made a little batch of probably about 20 of them and they sold out like within minutes. Oh, on my goodness. website so um that just became a thing a recurring thing um and I'm still making I still make little people took a break from here and there um because they're also one of those things that take a lot of time mm-hmm. but I realized that I could charge what I need to charge and people will pay what they're worth and so I picked it back up again more recently during the last episode that I was talking with Kelly from Die Mad Yarns and we went off mm-hmm. on a whole conversation about crochet fast fashion and how, you know, even crochet slow fashion where you're making things, you know, like you did, mm-hmm. it's you're never going to be able to be paid enough for that. Right. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, when somebody's like, oh, my gosh, you Nick, can you make me a sweater? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> They just laugh it off. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear that. So yeah. Upward silent. No. I always leave make it, them feel oh uncomfortable. Gosh, you should learn how to knit. And then they're like, but I'll pay yes. you. And I'm like, no, you can't afford me. <laughs> yeah. That's that's honestly the best response. Yeah. And I, I've seen some people uh, be successful with like making for celebrities. And I feel mm-hmm. like they're the only people that are probably getting paid properly. Otherwise, that I don't know who's shelling out thousands of dollars besides celebrities yeah (laughs) yeah part of your website I was reading through and um you talked about your like go go with the flow mentality and I think that that really shows with your business trajectory right like Mm -hmm. you went where people were like oh I love that can you do this for me and then realized Mm -hmm. that you didn't have to stick with it and you can kind of grow and flow as it goes so I mm-hmm. I love that that's the approach that you took because people can get really like stuck in doing one thing and they feel like they can't change. Businesses are like people, you know, they can grow and change. Okay. As well. Do you have any idea of like the next thing? So far, I have started something new recently within this year, um, and that's crochet hook candles yeah. out of play. That's right. Yeah. And so it's it's fairly new for me still and it's going well. So I think it would be something that I'll keep around. My specialty with clay has been for the last couple of years has been um, color changing clay. And I specialize in clay that changes color in the sun. So when you take it outside, um, even if it's a cloudy day, you can still see, you know, UV breaks through the clouds. So you can still see the color change happen. That's so cool. I have quite a few stitch markers with that color change effect. And I've started doing crochet hooks with the effect. So yeah, that's like, that's something I definitely want to keep doing. Yeah, they're beautiful. I love them. And it's like, what a good way to encourage people to get outside too, right? Right. It's like, all right, we've got our crochet hook and we're doing our favorite thing, you know, with fiber art. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to also go outside so we can enjoy the color change happening. (laughs) Yeah, it's really cool because the color change is not permanent. So you can watch it over and over when you go into the shade or cover the item up. It goes back to 
the previous color or um like more recently i made one that's completely white with sparkles Mm -hmm. and then when you take it into the sun it's like pink and purple and orange and yellow so it's like really stark contrast to what it was when it was in the shade um it just it's so fun to watch the change happen. Yeah, that's neat. You spent eight years in the Navy. Yeah. Were you able to craft then or was that like a break for yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, I crafted all through my Navy career. I actually was in the Navy when I made that first Amigurumi. Nice. And a lot of the people that were purchasing Amigurumi from me were my coworkers. Oh, great. So I made um, Minion. I made a very very specific bear it was the flag for kenya so it went from red to yellow to green and then it had a black star in the middle and then i also made the mexican flag this bear was red white and green and then it had i had um printed the seal that's in the center of the mexican flag on fabric and i stitched it on the bear's tummy this is all like from they saw the bear that i made um and everybody wanted some type of bear when i was in the navy i probably had more business because i was around a lot of people and yeah. then they would see me making stuff or someone would say oh yeah she made a bear for me or she made this or that so they were just telling all their friends and family too that's great word of mouth love it okay yeah so you also have amigurumi patterns on mm-hmm. your site and the frog is cracks me up <laughs> <laughs> but i love the dolls where did where did the inspiration come from this i actually started making the dolls when i had a daughter and she requested that i make her a doll mm-hmm. i was still making the trotros the little donkeys when she was little mm-hmm. and she asked me oh can you make me a doll So I decided to make her like a little like doll that kind of looked like her. Mm -hmm. And I used braiding hair on it. Quite a few people either wanted a doll or wanted to know how I made it Mm -hmm. for the ones that did crochet. And I politely declined making other people dolls because they were really like, it's a lot of stitches Mm -hmm. to make a doll. Yeah. I definitely had no problem writing up a pattern for them. So Smart. that's kind of how I ended up making doll patterns was after um, after I made my daughter's doll. Mm-hmm. People wanted to know how, how did you get it in that shape or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Marina, who is on the podcast a lot and has worked with making for a while um, in one capacity or another, she actually wrote a blog post about growing up with representation and craft and all of that and how growing up in the 70s and 80s as a little black girl it was like impossible to find a doll that looked like her and all of the barbies were white and all of the superheroes were white and all this stuff and how Mm -hmm. her mom and grandmother were like nope we're not allowing this to happen we are we are going to make toys that look like you so that when you are playing and i just love i don't know we love representation so I love that that kind of came came from this as well, too. And it fuels a lot of my makes, like Mm -hmm. the little stitch markers that I make. Um, I offer three different skin tones for them, Um, like a lighter tan, medium brown, and then like a deeper brown. Um, And then pretty much all of my doll samples, I make them in some form of brown. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually even made Michelle Obama. Love it. <laughs> it. It's like a little Emmy groomy me, Michelle. And oh, yeah, that was yeah, for. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, yeah. There, so there's a pattern for that too. And I just tried to capture her like single arched eyebrow mm-hmm. and, um, you know, just a little bob that she used to rock back in the day. It's just, it's the little things, you mm-hmm. know, little features that kind of makes it actually look like the person. But yeah, representation is definitely a huge mm-hmm. goal of mine. Love it. That's awesome. Okay. So as we've been talking about all of this, it kind of leads us to what we're going to be talking about today, uh, which is kind of the history of and a few facts about Amirumi. So before Mm -hmm. we jump into that, let's talk about what are you working on right now? Or do you have any like fun personal projects happening or is it all work related? (laughs) I'm working on um, a sweater for myself. 
I want something that I can wear with like anything, kind of a staple cardigan and I'm crocheting it. I don't think there will be a pattern for that. So that's just for me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also working on the crochet version of my flying bird shawl. Nice. Uh, whenever I make a pattern, if I can, I try to do a knit and crochet version. So cool. That's what I'm working on. I'm still working on my second mini mock neck tank by Jesse Made. Mm -hmm. The first one I am so close to being done is just weaving in those ends. As we all know, sometimes <laughs> that can be the barrier to wear, but this yeah. weekend it is going to happen. And then um, I work, I've been working on the second one using some Laviana Me yarn and um, oh, fun. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I accidentally uh, had to frog it and because I twisted a shoulder somehow, I literally oh, don't know how yeah. I did it. It was, <sighs> but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> We're okay. We can frog things. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fine. I heard you telling Telling uh, Kelly about that on the last pod, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh. "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it happens. It happens to the best of us." No, um, and that's actually why I made Frog Frog. Oh my gosh, the, the frog Emmy grew me. Yes. Um, it is the frogging mascot. It's a double-sided frog, which is why it's called Frog Frog, and it's also the frogging frog. So it's like I a totally um corny name but i love it when you make a frog frog for yourself you're making a little companion to commiserate with you mm -hmm. while you frog you can put like a smile on one side or a grumpy face a confused face whatever you pick two expressions probably your top two expressions when you have to frog <laughs> <laughs> the arms are nice and lanky so you can wrap it around your project and i'll typically sit my frog frog with a project that maybe needs to go in timeout before I actually do the action yeah. of frogging. Uh, oh, that's good. So I'll just like tie his little arms around the project. <laughs> like, I'm gonna give this one a hug until it's ready to be frog. So yeah, oh. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to make a frog frog. <laughs> I love that. I know I'm gonna have to do it. I've, I have made one amigurumi before and it is. Is it lentil? It is lentil. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's so cute. It's, you know what? It's funny. You see it, her little cat? Yes. Aww. It's a little cat. Yeah. <laughs> Quaylen had told me that if I put lentils in the bottom, it'll like sit fun. And then that's fun because it's like lentils are in lentil. But um I Oh yeah. Some of my stitches are not very tight. So every once in a while yeah. I will find like little lentils around the area. A little that... dropping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lentil is literally lenteling everywhere <laughs> oh my gosh that is so funny but I'm so proud of it and like it definitely is not nowhere near perfect and like the ears are kind of funky and like I can see some of the stuffing but I was just like I did this this is so rad yeah if you're gonna put like beans in an amigurumi um if you have like any stockings that you don't use maybe they've got like a hole or something oh. um <laughs> put them in there and then put them in the stuffed animal so the stocking can hold all the all the little beads. That that makes beads. more sense than what I did. They're oh my god, they're falling out everywhere. Okay. <laughs> I need to oh, stop I handling lentils. Lentil, out. <laughs> <laughs> lentil is a look but don't touch. <laughs> oh. oh, still still proud of myself for it. That's fine. <laughs> yes. It's adorable. I love it. Okay. So um Let's talk about the history of amigurumi. The history of amigurumi is kind of like other crafts. It really doesn't have a specific point when it started. Mm -hmm. um, according to Google, it started in the 1600s BCE mm -hmm. in the Shang Dynasty, which is in China. And those were primarily knitted. Supposedly the first record of the crochet amigurumi is in Japan, and I couldn't find a date for that or an approximation for when um, the crochet amigurumi became popular. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely um, a different a different craft. When you yeah. look at the knit version of dolls and the crochet, like crochet has more structure for the dolls, and there are more shapes being made versus just a head, a body, and legs. Um, so when it comes to amigurumi. 
you can see in the history, people were making animals and actual things like food and cups and stuff like that. I don't think anybody was knitting Mm -hmm. those types. So amigurumi as a crochet craft has been, it's just been like, how do I say it? Crochet amigurumi has really like leveled up the craft of amigurumi itself. Yeah. I mean, like you said, there is the, the, there's more structure, which makes more sense. I mean, not saying that like, you know, one is not saying that knitting uh, a doll is wrong because that is, you know, do what you want. Yeah. Your craft. But, um, I, I do. Mm-hmm. I can see that for sure. As I was like looking through some of the history of my brain went to like the first person who invented something like a craft or whatever. Did they just like pick up a stick and yarn? And it was like, we call this a cast on. And like <laughs> this hook can make a loop. And then the, this is now fabric and it's called crochet. Like it blows yeah. my mind when I think about that because. Mm-hmm. Like, how did that first happen? And then, and then, of course, I go, okay, well, they needed yarn. So who was the first person to, like, look at a sheep and go, we can make that in strands that then we can make into fabric. Like, yeah, it blows my mind as well. So and I, I constantly think about that with, with crafts and with, like, food things, too. Like, how did we decide to start eating this? Um, <gasps> it doesn't even look like it wants to be eaten. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like pineapples, for example, like what? I guess maybe they smell good, but yeah. they look aggressive. Oh, like, yes. Like how do we start eating them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's yeah. It's definitely something that that crosses my mind often, um, especially with amigurumi, because it's just kind of like, how did you decide to start making little things, little dolls and um, animals and figures out of yarn? Yeah. But whoever thought of it, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> because exactly. it's awesome. Yes, good job. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't even say it's like necessity is the mother of invention because we didn't need this. Right. <laughs> like these are just fun things. Like you, you don't need amigurumi. We just want it. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I wonder if part of it was um, like access to things or even maybe it was representation, right? Like, true, I don't know. True. Now I wish we could, yeah. gosh, there's so many times where I have started doing research on something. I'm like, I wish that there was a way to like somehow communicate with these people that like actually yes. started the craft because, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the, or maybe this was before we started recording. I don't remember. Anyways, a lot of the history of is very whitewashed and you know it's like okay when we start looking up history of and it doesn't really mention anything before a certain date it's like well I don't that doesn't seem right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I want to go back yeah. and like talk to the true people who started these things so I don't know maybe mm-hmm. technology will someday allow that to happen uh, that's that's right? also going into like some I don't know where's Quaylen when you need anthropology you need him in like <laughs> ghosts and stuff <laughs> Yeah, right. We do <laughs> Ooh, let's do a seance and talk to the people who like first <laughs> and find out where <laughs> a crochet history seance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Funny. Side note on the dates. Um, pretty sure it's even more than four hundred and twenty-three years. Oh my god! Probably. Oh my gosh! Hold on. So I did the math and the Shang dynasty was almost 423 years ago. It's a long time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was going to say, if you want to redo that part, about- well, why did I try and do the math? That's the thing. Because <laughs> I'm not I good just at thought math. about it and I was like, You're wait, like, it goes please. down from 1600. Yeah. The Shang dynasty <laughs> ruled from 1600 to 1046 BCE. It had to go all the way down to zero, one, yeah. and then go and up, go up to where right. we are now. <laughs> so it's like literally thousands of years ago. <laughs> well, yeah. Somebody probably would have been in the comments like, yo. <laughs> I mean, I do talk a lot about on this podcast how I'm not good at math. So the fact that I okay. got that wrong <laughs> is should be surprising to no one unless this is your first time watching this. And now you know I'm not good at math. 
So uh, 1041 BC was 3,063 years ago-ish. So that's more along the line. Dear God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we we got there. (laughs) Yeah, we got there. Okay, back to (laughs) the history of. (laughs) When I was looking at the history and um, I saw I was looking at pictures the focus seemed to really lean towards toys Mm -hmm. and i found an um i found out that it was really just kind of like providing children with a different sensory object to play with Mm -hmm. other than the typical wooden toys plastic toys and whatever else is out there giving kids amigurumi gives them something different to feel and understand so i thought that was pretty awesome i love that Just don't give them one with lentils inside of it that are not contained in something else. Definitely. There's like a whole um, organization that is dedicated to letting you know what things are safe for kids and the the safety eyes that people use. Um, If you get them from certain places, they'll let you know um, like what age, age three and up or whatever. So if you're worried about giving... um, something that's like a choking hazard to a kid make sure to look out for those little labels apparently in the late 80s it came back in a big way thanks to um nhk which is the international service of japan's public media organization there is a show called ami or ami i am not 100 percent sure so uh Mm -hmm. we'll just go with that uh but i was like oh that's great a tv show that was like brought it back yeah (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. And then, of course, like with the uh, kawaii culture and all of that, I think that that was also helpful. And like Hello Kitty and that kind of resurgence of things in the late 70s, early 80s also brought it back into, you know, the pop culture of everything. And then here it is today. Yeah, it's come a long way for sure. There's Mm -hmm. so many different aspects to amigurumi um whether using it for educational purposes i've seen people do like an anatomical heart i've seen people teaching about different parts of the body eyes and all that stuff through amigurumi it's definitely a craft that can be used in many different ways if somebody has yet to try it what would be your suggestion on like where to start I would say start small, like something that you can hold in your hand. Don't try to attack like, you know, those, I don't know if you've seen, like gigantic amigurumis are the ones that are like almost life size. Mm-hmm. Um, just start small, um, maybe make a ball, like a little, you can make yeah. like a stress ball or something. Stuff it with yarn scraps. Like you don't have to get like fancy equipment or um, things to add to them. If you're just trying it out for the first time, if you already have yarn. Mm-hmm. you can start with what you have i definitely was like excited about the lentils thing because i was like oh i have those i can just use that and then you know as we know that could have i could have gone one step further but we also have the free lentil patterns on the making app too so um i've got to make a lentil you do i haven't made one yet oh my gosh make a lentil quaylen made this one i love the color pulling on his i know yeah <laughs> so good and lentil was definitely a star very early on on our tiktok page we love lentil so lentil is our brand mascot at making um i probably should have clarified that quaylen created patterns that are in the making app and um i'll put in the show notes where to find it in the app but they like sit behind me and watch me Mm -hmm. work (laughs) adorable I love it. I love a mascot. As you can tell, I love a mascot. Oh, yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like, I mean, Groomy is like super popular on TikTok. There's so many artists that have shared it there. And the hashtag has 3.2 billion views. Wow. That's how popular That's a lot. it is on there. That's a lot. Um, and I didn't have to do math for that. So it's it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Rest assured. <laughs> Rest assured. It is correct. That is, yeah. That is very awesome. I've come across a lot of creators just because of Amigurumi that they've made and posted and found out that they do all kinds of other things too. But um, I guess the algorithm knows that I love Amigurumi. So they're constantly like showing me 
people are making little animals and dolls and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I found a lot of cool accounts through Amigurumi. Yeah. From GuinnessWorldRecords.com. So it's the, yeah, the largest display of crocheted sculptures. And it was Mother India's Crochet Queens. And it was in January of 2018. The number is 58,917 items in within wow this sculpture and wow yeah amazing it was made was that made by like several people kind of contributed to it i'm assuming yeah it doesn't say how many members but it was it does say that there were Mm -hmm. it was made by it was made by several people um and yeah that's really cool from india as well as indians living in other countries so they were collected by one person and put on display, and then they were in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was trying to find other things like the biggest one and, you know, I don't know, other that was the only one I could find. So if anybody else finds any cool facts, like drop them in the comments or send them to HQ at makingco.com and we'll bring them up in future episodes is there a certain animal or shape that you have not done yet that you want to do besides lentil? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love lentil shape. A yes, very fun yes. shape. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't made a lion yet, and that's my favorite animal. Oh, my gosh. You have um, to. Yeah. I feel like I would want to make a lioness, like not with the mane, just like the actual uh, female lion. Um and I don't know, maybe make it kind of like cutesy, not necessarily like realistic or anything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, definitely a lion. Love it. Love it. So what did you see this week in the making app that was inspiring? Actually, I watched your latest pod Yay! with Kelly. Yeah. And that inspired me to like look into cryptids because I hadn't even heard of the word before. Oh my God. Um and so, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was a nice little deep dive on the internet that I did. Oh, yeah. Inspired by y'all. <laughs> um, that conversation was awesome. I've been following a lot of people. There are some really cool makers on there. I saw someone doing um, the Japanese style of dyeing fabric. Um, I forget what it's called. I think it's like Shibui or something close to that. Close to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting it yeah. right now, but yeah. Um, but basically they use indigo Mm -hmm. and some type of natural fiber fabric that was just like, it's gorgeous. It's like these deep blues and really pale blues and then it's like tie dye and really gorgeous. So yeah, making up is just so many different types of crafters on there. I love it. I know that is one of my like favorite things about it is the multi-craftualness because it's it just like shows I don't know just how many different ways that we can be creative as humans and sometimes it can be dangerous because then I'm like ooh I want to do that oh, and yeah. it's like <laughs> who has time for another Jen come on get it, get it together you don't have time for that uh, <laughs> I don't need another hobby I don't need another hobby but I mean yeah. I'm not against it <laughs> not against it it's uh, my excuse is that I work for making and that's <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Yeah. Gotta try, gotta try some things out yeah. so you can relate to people on what they exactly. what they do. I know, and it's yeah. we've had a lot of like fiber arts content on the podcast, and I keep like going, okay, we. I know there are people coming up that are not directly fiber arts related, but for some reason, I think it was just with Flock Fiber Festival and all of that content, and then we just kept. That was going. a lot of content. Oh, there's more. amazing content. <laughs> I, I know I saw that some of them like the event um I thought that was a really cool feature like um when you see that you've posted an uh interview or a meet and greet yeah and you can like click on the link and see like when it's gonna be or it says like coming soon if you haven't like uploaded yet that's pretty cool yeah, awesome I just talked with Rachel from Ritual Dyes who is running mm-hmm. Sacred Sheep in Portland and so we're gonna be doing some stuff for that festival too and then a couple nice. of other I don't want to I don't want to say too much before we've had like a final conversation but we've had there's another festival that m- reached out to us and is interested in possibly partnering so well there will be mm-hmm. lots of fiber arts content happening though we are multi um yeah you want ice cream and an ice cream cone we did that already today 
You still want it? Oh, you're so cute. How She's giving me like the sweetest little puppy dog eyes. I cannot. She knows. Mm -hmm. She knows the She's look. fully aware. <laughs> she is. She has perfected her craft. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of crafty. Yeah. <laughs> She's already crafty. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, two things that stuck out to me. Nat the craft bat. Uh, Natalie is making a really cool quilt. And it's a it's like a spooky time quilt and it's got ghosts and skulls and it's also just very cute. So um, now that we're entering spooky season, I was like, let's give that a shout out. Also, they have a very cute cat on their page. And um, I'm a fan of any time anyone posts their animals in <laughs> the making app. And then also our very good friend Don Catherine um, creates very cool designs and there is a sticker that she posted and it is a skein of yarn with like mushrooms coming out of it and oh that's cool it's glow in the dark I love some glow in the dark stuff I know so that is so like, cool okay that's fun well those are my those are my two for this week but there's I know it's really hard to pick like yeah it is tough. And I like that's one of those apps where you can really get lost in the feed because it's just so much good stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we haven't even like, okay, the word algorithm can be very scary for some people, but technology can also be used for good, which is what we will be doing. But we haven't even implemented like the actual like algorithm of, yeah. of it all. Let's end with a moment of gratitude. What are you grateful for? I am grateful for the amount of time that I get to spend doing things that I love. Um, and that's not just crafting, uh, whether it's, uh, for example, last weekend, I went swimming with my kids and their friends. The fact that I'm a stay at home mom, and I have, you know, time to do that. I'm super grateful for that. We didn't even talk about what you do when you're not crafting. And I know that you're a mom, but like, do you have any other like non crafty hobbies or not really. Not really no. No. They're you all know. crafty. Every once in a while, I, I have a lot that I don't really show online. I paint and I sew and I have shown that a little mm -hmm. bit. I also make like sculptures outside of stitch markers. Yeah. So yeah, I, I have other craftsy things, but nothing, nothing non-crafty. I like to listen to audiobooks while I, oh, yeah. while I work. Okay. What is, do you um, have any suggestions? What's the last thing that you listened to that was just like awesome? I actually just started this book. It's called That One Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Demon. <laughs> and it's like romance. <laughs> and it's not very long. I think the total of it is like eight hours or something. Nice. But it's good. That sounds right up my alley, honestly. <laughs> like, I'm not yeah. a big romance book person. But the fact Me either. That, yeah. I'm more of like a um, thriller. Usually like thrillers and sci-fi. Um, a book that I recently read is called Null Set. I read it's like a physical book. Um, and that's by it's actually right here, S. L. Wong. Okay. That book is a little like a thriller mm. type of, you know, a little action. Um, so I guess that's another hobby that I have is reading. Yeah. I definitely don't do it as much as I want to, but mm. when I get those audiobooks in, that kind of fulfills that that need to read mm -hmm. i've been watching ahsoka on disney plus yeah if you're a star wars person ahsoka has been amazing i need to check that out yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so good it's so good i am grateful for the fact that i get to see beyonce tonight <laughs> that is awesome yeah. so i have wow um friends that have driven up i have my friend Stacia drove out from Portland and my friend Chelsea's coming in from Tacoma and Val's going to come in. And like we have we're just all going to get together and watch Beyonce. And um, I have a really good Beyonce story. Back in the day, I worked for a little company called Uber. And this was like way, way back in the very beginning is when I started. Yeah. And I helped do marketing for Seattle and then the Pacific Northwest and other like general marketing campaigns. And so every time we hit, would hit a milestone, we would all go to a different place. So like the first time was Tahoe and there was like 100 employees and then there was Miami and then that was like thousands. Wow. And then anyways, we end up in Vegas. 
And it was this giant like convention slash like, you know, at night we all get together and there's artists and people performing and we have dinner and da, da, da. So there was a rumor that there was a very big performer that would be coming at the, for the very last night. And the rumors included many different very famous people. But the only one there was one that I was very interested in, along with my co-worker Chelsea who's the same Chelsea that's coming with me tonight we don't again we don't obviously work at Uber anymore but um and then yeah. uh our friend Amber from Atlanta so we were like okay we are going to find the stage we are going to stand there we had friends that were going to like bring us like snacks and drinks and all of that we're just going to stand there until it uh, starts and depending on who it is will allow others to take our spot because there was only again one person that I was very very excited about so we get to a certain point of the night lights go down uh the CEO at the time gets up and like does this whole speech about how he's so proud of us and all of these things and the growth and da, 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 and he's like talking for like 10 minutes and we're like okay get to it get to it <laughs> and then he says everyone I would like to introduce the performer of the evening Please welcome Beyonce. And he drops the microphone. Wow. He like literally drops the microphone. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop literally. And we have a private Beyonce performance for a little over two hours. Wow. And like she was right in front of me. She looked me in the eyes four times. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. Wow. And that is my Beyonce story because. I, I, it was, I don't know how I got so lucky to be in that moment, but I will never forget that. And yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. It's going to be fun to see her tonight though, especially with, with my, with my gal pals. So that's what I'm thankful yeah. for. <laughs> awesome. Sweet. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining. And, um, you know, I think it's time that you got to go put some ice cream in a cone. <laughs> Right. My boss is calling. Yeah. Your boss <laughs> is calling. Sweet baby boss. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Thanks yep. again for joining. I will <sighs> list um, yeah. all of the places where people can find you in the show notes as well. So cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. To join the very first social marketplace app made for makers, crafters, and artists by makers, crafters, and artists, head to themakingapp.com download the app and join the amazing multi-craftual community. You won't regret it. Just so much inspiration and so many wonderful, wonderful humans. Did you know that you can also listen to the Making Conversation podcast in the Making app? Open the app, tap on Discover, and scroll down to Podcasts. From there, you'll see all of them listed. We've also started putting um, these up on YouTube if you haven't noticed. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. I am, I am a one- one woman show if you're listening there's a link down below to the episode on youtube and if you're watching on youtube there is a link to listen so choose your own adventure if you've made it this far and you're interested in sponsoring making conversation or having making at an event to collect content amazing maker stories vendor stories etc send us a note at hq at makingco.com we would so very much appreciate it if you were to share the podcast with your crafting community, whether that's online or offline. Um, you know, having more eyes and ears always feels real good. So thanks for watching and or listening. And we'll see you in the making app.